just for the people who don't know who we are. We're a, a national um, and international insolvency firm and forensic firm. Um, we um, can say that we are truly the only national firm in the sense that we have offices in all states um, and staff and practitioners in all states and territories, which we're very, very proud of. Um, and we also have offices in, in New Zealand and Malaysia and Singapore. Um, so uh, very, very proud of that. As I said, we've got three great presenters today. You're not, you're not here to listen to my introduction. We have, um, uh, we have a presenter talking about cryptocurrency. We have a presenter speaking about Vision 7A. We've got um, someone speaking about the small business restructuring. So, um, you know, it's just a fantastic array of, um, of topics. Just want to quick, quickly sort of uh, tell people where the state of the market is. Um, and I, I'm, Cassandra is going to speak a little bit later about the general state of the market in uh, respect to distress, but I'm specifically going to talk about the, um, the Australian Taxation Office uh, because it's, it is a live issue and they are the biggest instigator of, uh, of um, in, insolvency appointments in the sense of uh, either directly or in, indirectly. Um, as of today, the word is that there are um, 150 director's penalty notices that are being issued um, per day. Um, and they, people are not aware of director's penalty notices, but they're basically notices that are sent to the directors of companies, giving them a period of time to pay up, enter into a payment plan or enter, um, or enter into an insolvency um, process failing which becomes a personal liability. So very serious, they're issuing 150 of those a day. Unlikely to be wind-ups um, is what we're hearing. Um, there, there will be some wind-ups initiated by the tax office, but uh, we're hearing um, from the law firms that are on the ATO panels um, that they're getting told that there's going to be some um, being initiated, but um, not expected to be really driven by the tax office. Five to 6,000 repayment plans are being um, been entered into with the tax office per week. Um, most of them are one to two year plans. Some of them, in exceptional circumstances, have um, stretched out to three years. Um, and, and then I say exceptional, but most of one to two, two years is the word that we're hearing today. Uh, and according to the ATO, 25% of those are failing. So um, that's a quick snapshot. Insolvency, um, as Cassandra will say a little bit later on, we're back to pre-COVID levels. Insolvency appointments are um, back to sort of pre-COVID levels. Um, it's no surprise. You can see all the numbers that are coming through and all the talk um, in the mainstream media about insolvency. But at Rogers Reedy, um, our first attempt is to, you know, to save businesses and, and companies. And that is our, um, our, our priority, either through uh, a small business restructure or a voluntary administration. Um, failing which, if that's unable to be done, you know, there are other means such as liquidation um, and uh, personal bankruptcy that we, we can assist. Moving on, um, that's enough for me today um, in respect to my pitch about Rogers Reedy. If there's any questions that people have um, um, as a result of the, the presenters here today, please type them into um, uh, people here can put up their hand and ask a question. Um, but for the people at home and at work, they can just type it into the uh, to the question prompt, um, and we'll do our best to um, you know to answer those uh, in the webinar today. Excellent. Let's get to our first speaker. Um, Edward Henry is from Sladen Legal. He's a senior associate at, um, at Sladen Legal. Uh, they're tax lawyers who um, who specialise in trust and, and tax um, affairs. Um, we've got. Edward's going to, you know, talk specifically um, about trusts um, um, and particularly talk about Division 7A um, and particularly 100A. Is it 100A? It is, yeah. Oh, yeah, I've got it right. All these numbers. Yeah. All these numbers. But um, it, it's one thing that is, is very clear um, that we're finding out is that there's, there's a lot of inquiry in respect of the, the interpretation of the taxation, taxation office about 100A and, and, you know, there's a lot of questions that everyone answered. Um, Edward, thank you for attending today. Um, and as I said, if you have any questions of Edward, just um, feel free to type them in. So thank you. Thanks very much, Brent. Thank right. you. Just a uh, quick working. Um,
All right. Um, thanks, everyone, and thanks for the opportunity to speak to you today about yeah, Division 7A and Section 100A. It sounds a little bit scary, and I suppose it can be a little bit, um, but it's certainly a hot topic, and a large part of the the um, sort of the, the topic and you know a lot of the discussions being generated is really sourced from the ATO's um, interpretation of how these two particular provisions operate. It's not so much a, a case of you know recent cases have come out that have suddenly changed the landscape. What we really wanted to, I think, focus in on for the next twenty minutes on these two topics is really just the the, the you know the, the, the fact that you know we have the ATO that administers the law that takes an interpretation of the law. Um, and they, that may not, all, not necessarily align to, or, you know, it will usually be consistent with the judicial interpretation, but then if people want to challenge the ATO, they do have to go to court and that becomes an expensive process. So the ATO's interpretation is, is certainly very important and something to be very conscious of, particularly in these um, complex topics. And also, also thing to note, I do have 20 minutes, so I'll do my best to, to get through it all. There's probably... I mean, even a couple of hours worth of material in this, so um, I'll do my best to sort of skim over it, hopefully give everyone a bit of an overview and, and highlight some of the key things to be conscious of going forward. So Division 7A, what is it? So Division, Division 7A is really about um, shareholders or associates of shareholders of companies having access to companies' monies, like um, payments, loans, debt forgivenesses, those type of issues can trigger a Division 7A consequence, with the result is that a deemed dividend can be triggered to the shareholder, and that's an unfranked dividend. So it's not a, it's a pretty serious outcome, and it's not something that um, to be taken lightly. Um, it's quite broad, it's quite um, technical because it doesn't always necessarily apply from a, say, a loan or a payment from a company to a shareholder or associate. It can also apply for trusts who make loans or payments or forgive debts to associates also. So it's very broad, it's very technical, um, and requires a careful review. A large part of what I think triggered um, a discussion in the, in the marketplace is the ATO's interpretation of what exactly is a loan. Um, obviously, basic circumstance, a company lends money to a shareholder or associate, no problems. But um, because of the legislative definition of what a loan is, it includes this concept of financial accommodation. And because of this definition of financial accommodation and the ATO's view as to what financial accommodation actually means, the, the breadth of what a loan you know, is can really, you know, breadth you know, broaden the, the landscape of Division 7A and, and trigger unwanted consequences for taxpayers. There is a discretion that the ATO has to disregard a deemed dividend due to honest mistakes or inadvertent omissions. So you have to usually make an application to the ATO. It can be quite a, a lengthy process, but that's sort of the, the, the policy behind it, I suppose, is acknowledging that if you do trip up, if there is an inadvertent mistake or, or admission, um, the, the legislation takes it into account, you know, acknowledging that Division 7A is complex, um, but it does still require a, a, the discretion being exercised favorably, favorably by the ATO. There's also interactions with FBT and commercial debt forgiveness because you could have a company, say, lending money to an employee. You might ask yourself, was that an, a fringe benefit? Um, but certainly in the loan context, Division 7A trumps FBT, but not so much in the context of payments or debt forgivenesses. So again, more complexity. And pre-December 2009, unpaid present entitlements is something I'll go over in a little bit of detail next, but that's something to bear in mind also. So, effectively, we have this new tax determination, uh, which is a public ruling issued by the ATO that was finalised this financial year, but came out in draft form last financial year. And the draft form of that sort of was... Uh, it, it aimed to replace previous tax rulings from 2010 and the practice statements from 2010. Um, and it shakes up the landscape slightly in terms of the timing of when financial accommodation is provided. So back in 2010, when the tax rulings were first issued, they, the ATO formalised their position about an unpaid present entitlement. So, as you know, we have trusts in our landscape in Australia, they're very prevalent. Um, people use trusts for all sorts of reasons, but in, in particular, asset protection and also carrying on a business. And often um, a trust will want to, um, has to distribute income at the end of each financial year, because if it doesn't, the trustee gets taxed at 47 or 40, 40 you know, a punitive rate. So this, unlike a company, a trust has to distribute its income every year. And if it's carrying on a business, it's not ideal that the income, if it was to be kept in the trust, would be taxed at top marginal rates. So what um, is a common practice, and I'm sure many people would be aware, is this creation of an unpaid present entitlement where a a trust that carries on a business will make a company 
presently entitled to its income, but that amount won't actually be paid. It will actually sit within the trust. The trust will use that amount for its own working capital purposes. The company pays tax on that amount of 30%. And for a while, that was all considered fine by the ATO, but back in 2010, the ATO was saying, well, no, this is really a form of financial accommodation by the, by the company effectively not calling on the money, by the money being left in the trust and because of all related parties. The ATO's view was that effectively the company is lending this, the trust money um, and that's a form of a loan and therefore there would be a Division 7A consequence behind that. So to get around that idea, the ATO introduced this sort of concessionary, and this has been sometimes described to me as a bit of a fairy tale, um, but that's how um, that was the landscape, certainly before the end of, before the start of this financial year, but they introduced this concept of sub-trust arrangements. So where a trust does make a corporate beneficiary presently entitled to its income, but it's remained, it's left unpaid. Um, there were opportunities for the, the entities to enter into what's called a sub-trust arrangement under option one or option two, um, which were effectively interest only repayments for a division 7A loan. Because if you're, if you're within the division 7A landscape, you have to make minimum yearly repayments of principal and interest over either a seven year or 25 year period, depending on whether the loan is secured or not. And because of the ATO's different views now about um, financial accommodation, about what UPEs create, they introduced this concept of an option one or option two agreement, which allowed um, entities to enter into invest um, interest only repayments over a specified period, and then make a balloon payment at the end to end the UPE if you effectively. So there was no division seven A there. It would still be an unpaid present entitlement. It wouldn't trigger um, any 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 unfrank deemed dividend sort sort of consequences. The interesting thing is, though, um, the ATO's views haven't been judicially tested, um, and we're still sort of awaiting um, Division 7A and what, what, what's actually going to happen, because there have been discussions about um, changing the law with Division 7A um, going back even 10 years now. So there's a lot of discussion about, well, what's, what will the new Division 7A look like? We don't actually know, but it's certainly in the, in the, in the, in the, in the background. It's, it, there's something going on in Treasury, but whether, what we'll see in Treasury, what will eventually come out, um, it will be sort of a wait and see type moment. So with this new tax determination that's been finalised this financial year, a private company beneficiary will make a loan when the financial accommodation is provided. Okay, so the question is, well, when does the financial accommodation, when is that provided? So that will occur at the point of time when the private company beneficiary has knowledge of the amount that it can demand immediate payment from from the trustee. So when a trust purports to distribute income to a company beneficiary, at that time, um, the ATO's view is, well, and, and bearing in mind that the, the time when a trust will make a company presently entitled to its income will be just before the end of the financial year, the ATO's view is the time when that actual entitlement arises will be after that income year, and that is the following the income year in which the entitlement arises. So that kind of gives a bit more time for people to, to work out, have they got a Division 7A problem here? Should I potentially enter into a loan agreement or deal with it, or should I repay it up front? Um, I, just, I think I'm just seeing the next slide. Um, I'll just uh, I'll go into the sub trust a bit later. But effectively, if we can take an example, if you make a, a if a comp if a trust um, wants to distribute income to a company by the end of the 2023 income year, it won't be before the, it won't be until the 2024 income year that the financial accommodation is deemed to be provided by the ATO. And then you'll have until the lodgement date of the 2024 income year for the company to effectively um, put the loan under compliant Division 7A terms or pay it out in full. It's quite a complex sort of exercise. And as you can sort of see, timing is imperative with, with respect to all these things. Um, but I think the key thing to note and, and the main distinction between the draft guidance issued by the ATO at the end of last year and the finalised version of the guidance now is, is with, with respect to timing. The ATO were initially saying that if you create a fixed entitlement to trust income um, to a company at a certain point, that is when the financial accommodation is provided. So it would mean if you used a fixed percentage amount in your distribution minutes, say, by the, before, say on 30 June 2022, um, that would mean that that would be a, a, an unfranked, potential unfranked dividend unless a, a loan agreement under Division 7A terms is entered into by the company by the lodgement date of its 2022 income year, which is roughly around May 2023. Apologise if I'm getting a little bit technical, but the provisions are quite technical. Um, and I think both what I'm trying to focus on and highlight is, is the, the significance of timing. Timing is just so fundamental when it comes to these things. 
And you've probably heard me talk about subtrusts before and, and, and what, what, what is a subtrust. So a subtrust is really a creature of the actual trust deed itself. So, um, and the option one and option two agreements I was speaking about before were a form of subtrust acknowledged by the ATO. Now, with the release of this finalized tax determination for 2022 slash 11, the concept of an option one, option two agreement is no longer around. It's, it's not possible to enter into them from this financial year. Um, the slide there is just highlighting some of the key points about well, what is a subtrust, how is it evidenced, um, and it really depends, as I was saying before, on the trustee itself. A lot of commentators have been suggesting that the subtrust is dead, that you don't really have subtrusts anymore because of the ATO's extended um, views about what is a, you know, a UP and the provision of financial accommodation. Um, and in many respects, that's probably correct. Um, there are certain provisions in the Division 7A landscape that deal specifically with UPEs. But because of the ATO's um, interpretation of what a loan is and that it would include an unpaid present entitlement um, between related parties, in many respects, um, having putting something on a subtrust may not actually offer much much opportunity at all, or it may just perhaps just kick the can down the road, if you like. Um, but ultimately, you still have a liability at the end of the day. And there's some sort of time frame differences between the old practice statement in 2010 and the tax determination in 2022, sort of highlighting before actually that bit on the right about the timing of when. So as you can see, the private company becomes presently entitled to a trust income, so that will be per, you know usually determined when the trust um, creates a distribution minute, makes the company presently entitled, and then the ATO's view is because the income of the trust isn't actually really determined until a couple of months later. That's when the financial accommodation is provided. So it's in the it's in effectively the following income year that the financial accommodation is provided, and then you've got until the lodgement date of the company's tax return for the 2024 income year, which would be in 2025, um, for effectively a Division 7A loan agreement to, to be put under compliant terms, and the first minimum yearly repayment of principal and interest to be made by the end, by 30 June 2025. So just focusing there, particularly on that right, the, 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 the diagram on the right, which is taken from the tax determination. Yeah, just the, the, the importance of timing, because at the end of the day, if you don't have the Division 7A loan agreement in place, um, that is the point where you have an unfrank dividend. And that's when you still have to ask yourself the question, um, was that triggered from an honest mistake or inadvertent omission? Do I need to make a voluntary disclosure to the ATO? The process becomes a lot more complicated um, and um, certainly something that can be easily avoided by entering into a correct agreement by the relevant deadlines. Now, there is um, an also a, a PCG from 2017-13, which gets consistently updated from the ATO. PCG is a practical compliance guideline. It doesn't have the same force of law that a tax determination or a tax ruling has, um, but it's effectively a, a, a guidance to um, AT officers as to how to apply the law, how to administer the law for taxpayers, and it's very useful to have regard to. As I was talking about before, under the, the previous sort of um, scheme, I suppose, or the administration the ATO was using, um, these option one and option two interest only arrangements were entered into by a lot of taxpayers, and their maturity date was coming up, um, at, you know, seven year or 10 year periods. By, the, by that period, they would have had to have fully repaid out the loan in full, or the UPE, if you like. So um, because of that, and because of the fear that well, a lot of companies may not actually, or may, a lot of trusts may not actually be able to repay it out in full, um, the ATOs effectively said that in the year that the, that the option one or option two loan agreement comes to maturity, there's an opportunity to, to effectively um, put a Division 7A loan agreement in place to effectively extend the period in which you're going to repay this amount. So um, what that ends up um, meaning really is that you can have a significant amount of time to actually enter into a Division 7A or enter into a UPE, convert it to a Division 7A loan. And it could be, you know, 16, 17 years down the track before it actually all has to be repaid. It's a pretty complicated diagram there that we've used for another presentation. But as you can see, if you take the very right top right there, and if you entered into a, if the private company became presently entitled um, by 30 June 2022, it could potentially get until 30 June 2031 to actually really pay out the full amount of the loan, which seems like a, a really long time. And if managed carefully, you can do it, but um, query whether you'd want to do that, um, given the administrative requirements, um, whether it just be more simple to enter into a Division 7A loan in the first place. 
and also query as well, um, given you know potential legislative changes to Division 7A, what exactly that might mean. Mm -hmm. um, it's still a bit of a watch this space in terms of well, if that new legislation were to come into place, how would this administration administrative um, sort of requirements interact with that? Because at the end of the day, um, the ATO administers the law, it doesn't regulate the law, um, and it has to follow the law as well. And that's just a bit more of an example from an option two if it's a 10 year interest only repayment. So in summary, um, from 1 July 2022, it's no longer possible to enter into option one, two or three subtrust arrangements. Arrangements, the interest only options that were available previously are no longer around. Um, you've got tax determination 2022 slash 11 now to really have regard to when looking at um, when financial accommodation is provided. And we really are within the Division 7A landscape now. Unpaid present entitlements are very much a feature of, of a loan. Um, certainly, that's the ATO's view. And um, it, it does seem like if, if, if legislation does come into force, that that would be. Um, probably accepted also, that's certainly what's been proposed, but it's a bit of a watch this space. Just conscious of time, I've got about five minutes. Yeah, 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 yeah. So on a completely different issue now, I suppose it still concerns trusts. Trusts cause a lot of um, interesting sort of um, <laughs> um, issues for us in the tax, uh, tax space and the private client space, but Section 100A has become, um, it's an old provision that came out in the 80s it was designed to counter some really egregious bad behaviour. Um, but what we've noticed in the last, say, five or ten years is the ATO has started to broaden, perhaps, the, the, the spectrum of how Section 100A actually applies. And it really does capture a lot of sort of family type arrangements that we didn't necessarily envisage would have been captured within the ambit of the provisions. What's interesting about Section 100A also is that it's subject to an, an unlimited period of review. So if the ATO think that you're Get, or your clients have engaged in a Section 100A exercise, um, it could mean the ATO could go back for as long as they like effectively to, to amend your return or, or scrutinise your affairs. Now, the ATO are saying that that's not what they propose to do, but it is certainly within their grasp and certainly within their, their framework within the legislation. That slide, the only point of that slide is just to sort of amplify how complex the law actually is. Because it was written so long ago, Trying to just read read it is in itself a pretty tricky exercise. Now, if anyone could tell me um, what that means, um, I'd be very interested to know. But, but what it actually does effectively mean, though, is um, it's looking at tax avoidance purposes. But the way it's written, as you can see, pretty old, pretty difficult, pretty convoluted. Um, and that makes the exercise pretty difficult for us as advisors. The other thing to note as well is that there aren't very many court cases um, that have looked at Section 100A, and the ones that have, have been on really, really egregious, pretty dodgy um, fact scenarios. Now, there's one particular um, case at the moment that's going to be heard in the full federal court shortly called Guardian AIT, um, and that concerns um, what's called a washing machine arrangement that the ATO never really liked, and it, it revolves the circulation of funds between a corporate beneficiary and, and its trust. And in the federal court, the federal court actually held that Section 100A didn't apply to that arrangement because of of a whole range of factors that are going to be sort of tested again now in the full federal court. But it's certainly a bit of a watch this space with 100A. What comes out of that full federal court judgment will be really interesting. The requirements of Section 100A are pretty tricky, but it's really about trying to capture arrangements where there's a mismatch between substance and form, if you like, um, where a trust purports to distribute income to a specified beneficiary on paper, but the money actually goes somewhere else. Um, and that's to take advantage of, that could be to take advantage of a whole range of things. Now, the main exemption to all of this is, is it an ordinary family or commercial dealing? That, that phrase, ordinary family or commercial dealing, is the phrase that is still uncertain. What does it mean? It's, it's what is ordinary? I know, I mean, it was, this, this was introduced back in the 80s. What was ordinary in the 80s? I mean, given what happened with COVID the last three years, who knows what ordinary is anymore? But that's the words of the legislation and, and the court cases you know, I've, I've consistently highlight that the the, um, the best meaning of interpretation is to look at the statutory text and ordinary family commercial dealing, that's what the text says. So there's a lot to sort of grapple with with 100A and working out what exactly is an ordinary family or commercial dealing. There's a tax ruling and a PCG on the topic uh, that came out um, end of last year. It's still in draft form. And I think because they're waiting to see what happens with the Guardian AIT case that comes out shortly. There's a whole range of colour codes that you have to have regard to, and that's the way, ATA's way of saying, if you're in the red zone, you're likely to be at high risk. If you're in the white zone, 
not subject to ATO scrutiny. And then you've got this middle zone as well. And there's some of the green zone examples, sort of basic sort of scenarios where the money actually, you know, my tax lecturer always used to say, follow the money. And I think that's what the ATO is all about here. If, if, if the money actually hits the beneficiary's account, you shouldn't have a Section 100A problem. And there might be other legitimate reasons where the money doesn't hit the beneficiary's account because of, say, working capital purposes, the whole unpaid present entitlement thing that I was talking about before with Division 7A. So it's not the end of the story when the money doesn't follow the form. But at the same time, you may potentially find yourself foul of Section 100A um, if there is some serious mismatches and if there's a, a significant tax avoidance purpose. Edward, I mean, the standard, you know, um, parent, you know, distribution and then, and then to, um, you know, to the children. Yep. Um, and, you know, the, the flow of funds are not hitting the kids' bank accounts by they're making payments on their behalf and those sort of things. The, the, are they the sort of, yeah, is that the sort of level? There's been a lot of fear around. That, that, that's the red zone at the moment. Is but, that the red zone? But, 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 but um, qualifying that, um, and I think I've got an example here. Um, uh, I'll just, which is a time, but um, effectively, they've the, the released a taxpayer alert um, on this very type of arrangement that you're referring to there, Brent. Um, and it's this idea that parents are making adult children presently entitled to income. And the argument is, well, that the children are really getting reimbursed for expenses that the parents incurred <coughs> before they were, when they were younger, when they were before the age of 18. Um, according to the ATO, that's not an ordinary family commercial dealing. They're the sort of arrangements that the ATO are really, I think, coming down on. And it's been um, certainly something I haven't seen too much in my practice, but it must have been something that a lot of perhaps very common in accounts, you know, like when, 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 a, when, a, when you have to resolve to distribute income from a trust, you, you, you may have regard to the various beneficiaries and their, their marginal tax rates and potentially be able to maybe um, generate a, a decent tax outcome that way. But this particular practice of making adult children presently entitlement to expenses that were incurred by the parents when the child was, you know, for secondary school fees, those type of things, they're right in the, the limelight of, of, of this taxpayer alert. So, um, yeah, it's more like an advisor warning. It's sort of interesting because the, the, the sentiments in the taxpayer alert were already reflected in the tax in the, in the draft rulings. It, it was almost a bit of overkill for the ATO that issue an alert, um, and also threatening um, promoter penalty type issues as well. So um, I think, in high level summary, because I'm conscious of time, Section 100A and there's 2014 website guidance as well that you can rely on, um, but they use a lot of um, <laughs> may and generally and the absence of other factors type words also. But um, the key thing to really bear in mind is that you, you should really re re review your distribution minutes for the past years because what may have been appropriate, you know, going back, you know, the last few years may not be appropriate going forward. Um, particularly if you're creating unpaid present entitlements in favour of, you know, individual beneficiaries, grandparents and things like that, and the money isn't actually received by them, you know, it's, it's, it's going somewhere else. If there's that mismatch between substance and form, um, if the money isn't, you know, if the money isn't really reaching the beneficiary, you might have a potential issue. So, so yeah. I'm, I'm, um, no, I'm, I'm sorry. It's that's right. To get out of yeah, we've got lots, lots of questions as well, but we, we, we won't have time, um, unfortunately. But uh, your advice is to get advice. Would that be right? I mean, yeah, it. Um, I mean, it's just so live at the moment, and, and things are moving very quickly. And as you said, yeah. we're waiting for some, you know, the results of it. It's, 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 it's really come about from the ATO's administration of this provision, and without further judicial guidance, it's very hard to know what's going to happen. Um, yeah, I think we just have to sort of carefully review the draft draft rulings and guidance from the ATO. And, and really consider whether Section A would apply. Um, it won't apply to the, your, your basic vanilla transactions, and the ATO acknowledge that. But when it starts getting a little bit convoluted, when you introduce, when you start distributing out to non-resident beneficiaries and the money is still in Australia, those type of things, um, yeah, or you, you're changing the trustee to engineer sort of a particular tax outcome, that's when um, I think Section 100A could have potential applications. So. Right. Yeah, but so, so my my desire to have lots of children, and just so I can distribute to them. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm kidding myself now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. right. Okay. Yeah, yeah. That, that's my, that's probably the my that, oh, that's the summary. I would. That's <laughs> uh, only what gets me through the day. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Excellent, Edward. Thank you very much. We've got one over time. As well. No, 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 no problems at all. We've got lots of questions. Um, you know, from people online, um, we'll, we'll answer those directly um, over the next couple of days. So, excellent. Thanks, Thanks very much. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you.
very good. Um, I'll move to the next um, panellist who's um, presenting today, um, Luke Matthias. Did I get it right? Well, excellent. Fantastic. <laughs> Luke is the founder of the Matthias Group, a tech-based finance broker for businesses based on core principles of all finance for all business. Matthias Group has a um, right relationship to help almost um, any business matter, um, linking those looking for finance to up to 300 lenders using artificial intelligence. Let's um, love to hear about that further as well. Um, his high-tech approach has seen him as an early adopter of blockchain technology and cryptocurrencies. Um, and that's what um, we've, we've got Luke here today. Um, Luke is uh, a cryptocurrency and, and as we've said, a business finance expert, and he'll be taking us through some real world and accounting issues for cryptocurrency. So thank you, Luke. Thanks for attending today. So. Now you've introduced me there as a cryptocurrency expert. The, <laughs> the, the first thing off the bat is I, Hello, everybody. My name is Luke Matthias. The first thing off the bat is I uh, I divide up this whole sector because whenever I jump into a room similar to this, um, I'm not going to throw throw into Marto's hat as the as the person who can advise on cryptocurrencies and put your money into a dog coin or a rabbit coin or something like that, and you'll make make millions. That's not that's not me. I am a an investor in cryptocurrency. I have been since 2017. I have had some magnificent wins, and I have had some magnificent losses at the same time and that's okay because we are still learning the piece i'm absolutely fascinated on is the flow of wealth the flow of asset available through the blockchain technology what can occur through this digital environment absolutely i've been all in on it for about four years now um, and we, we keep learning the technology keeps evolving and it's absolutely magnificent um, Bit of a background i have devoted basically my whole professional career to helping small businesses small medium enterprises smes in in australia uh created my firm 12 years ago started off in the old days as asset and car finance we used technology then to boost through the 2010s into working capital into all the various spaces always with a keen goal on finding every finance option and being every finance option for every corporate client we have, trade and debt and working capital, all these pieces. And we were approached in 2020 with this crazy idea to lend on cryptocurrency, using cryptocurrency as a, as a lendable asset, take security over it and, and give you fiat currency. At the time, I thought, oh, what, what is this? But the, the, the little piece of me just wanted to go down the rabbit hole for a while. So we researched it. We went further and further. And two and a half years in, we've become uh, quite a player in the, uh, the cryptocurrency lending space in Australia. The reason I'm saying this is with, with my whole everything, everything in us is to help the SMEs of Australia. I'm blessed with this audience today, which is an audience that I work with every day. Accountants and advisors are someone we speak to every day because they have the trust and vision for these two and a half million SMEs we have in the country that take all the risk, they pay all the GST, they create all the innovation, and they are still not given the support that they deserve, that they, that they should receive. So where that leaves is the accountant's network are the are the trust piece and a couple of years ago you thrown a curveball a curveball called job keeper all of a sudden every one of these SMEs got in touch with their accountants saying what's going on here what's going on with job keeper how can i qualify and it was it was chaos and by all means we were given a sort of a post-it note of information from the ato and and guidance to start off with but we've just received another curveball in this last financial year meaning that cryptocurrency earnings have to be reported have to be reported. Everyone always puts the, the inverted commas up. Legally, we have to report earnings from cryptocurrency. This is again a piece, I mean, there's seven very high level blanket legislations from the, from the ATO at the moment. Nobody really knows whether they're after or market when talking about it, and there's no one to call, there's no backup. There's no, uh, there's no I suppose, baseline to go to. Um, so let's have a look at what this cryptocurrency market is. I get asked all the time, is it here to stay? 
what is it? Are we going to make millions? Are we, is it all disappearing? Is it just a fad? Well, there are currently 200 million global registered holders of cryptocurrency. That's just the registered, the verified ones, the ones who know my name is Luke Matthias and I hold it in this wallet. It is an impossible task to know how many blind wallets there are holding, holding assets. And then you've got the people who are invested in funds and the fund have an underlying asset class being various cryptocurrency uh, coins, assets, NFTs, etc. It's very, valid, very valid that there are probably north of 300 million users uh, internationally of cryptocurrency. Is it, is it staying or is it going? It, seven months ago, it was a $3.1 trillion industry market cap. That makes it, it was around about sixth. I don't know where it ended up, but in the top 10 economies in the world, in finance, tech, oil, it's been around forever. Cryptocurrency, this digital space is young, it's brand new, and it's a top 10 global economy. I wish one of my young and new businesses got that, <laughs> got that sort of backing. Yeah. Um, in Australia, how many cryptocurrency holders do you think? What, what are we, 24 million uh, people here? 2 million plus hold some form of cryptocurrency. Average age, 58% of holders are sub 34. We're still in the early ages of adoption, very early on the adoption curve. Imagine where we're going to be in five years time when the adoption continues much, much the same as internet adoption happened occurred in the 90s. It's almost, it's almost line for line. What happens in five years time where the 34 year olds are now 40, the business owners, they're, they're pumping the economy and they are all majority cryptocurrency owners. This is a space that needs attention. It, we cannot, there's one piece to take out. We cannot just put our heads in the sand here as advisors, as accountants, hoping that that young or whatever it might be business owner over here who has crypto, I'm just gonna ignore that for, for, for a moment. This, whether it be a coin in particular or whether it be the industry, I don't know about the, whether the coin's gonna last. I, I have no idea. Blockchain usage is unequivocally going to be here. So take a step back. I'm not sure how educated everyone is on this space. What, what, what is blockchain? I Googled it a, a while ago. And it said immutable ledger. Still had no clue what <laughs> blockchain technology was. So everyone, and I, I almost, no harm to this, but I almost guarantee that 100% of the people watching and 100% of the people in the room use some form of blockchain technology. Think of DocuSign. When my accountant sends me my BAS statement, comes by email, and I go onto it, it's verified by my phone number and my email. I go onto it and I press go. I don't even read it. Press go and it goes back to him. I have legally agreed to that. And if I say, no, I didn't agree to that. What are you talking about? He says, I'm 12.39 on the 16th of August to this email address, you agreed to it. It's, it's unequivocal, you agreed. That is immutable, that is an immutable ledger. It's based on very early transition into blockchain. You know, these shared excels, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Everybody currently uses it. It's not a matter of when it comes. This wave of wave of uh, innovation is here. We're on the way. We've got to embrace it. What's an NFT? It's another key key term. It's a non fungible token. Well, what the hell does that mean? I had no clue. I'm going to break it down for you to take this away. It's a digital parcel to throw information around. You hear NFT and you think of this purple gorilla smoking a cigar where you buy it for $10 and you sell it for 10 million and you have no clue what happened in the middle. Well, all the NFT is wrapping up. It's, it's much the same as what a text message is to a letter. Same information, except it was sent. And I send you a text message, Brent, no matter what I call you, I cannot unsend that text message. It was sent on this day and date. It's a simple method of sending information. Digital art, it's line items, it's code. It's wrapped up in this little digital parcel that has this crazy name, but it can it is used to be able to pass wherever it goes along the blockchain. So it's it's you, you cannot complain about it. You did it. I sent you you a Bitcoin, an asset, an NFT. You cannot take it back. It's unequivocal. There's no cash. There's no missing T T crossing and I dotting. So don't think of an NFT and, and blockchain as these horrible 
terms that you don't understand. Just break it down and, and work out what they actually do and mean. The problem, <clears throat> the problem that we face, and we as in the accounting industry face, is last year we had a perfect storm, a perfect storm of hell for this whole whole space. So we started off the year, the, the financial year, booming up to Christmas, and then it fell off a cliff. And every person and their dog was trading, 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 because it's easy. We live in a world where friction is the enemy. And we're look, looking at pressing tick here for terms and conditions, tick here for paying your bass. Here, here's some money, online banking, bang. We've removed friction from this whole trading environment and let it loose on a lot of uneducated people. They don't know the, the, the pitfalls of what's happening here. So everyone's trading, trading, trading. And it's not just like I'm buying a Telstra share and then I'll sell a Telstra share. And then I'll buy something else a bit later on or buy a house. It's not like that. You might buy a Bitcoin and it goes up to being double in value. So you take half of your upside out and you put it into Cardano. You, you split that into Ethereum and Solana. Then you've got all the, the altcoins, you've got Dogecoin and Shiba, all these different things that, you, that, that you've heard of. What no one's looking at is the underlying capital gains tax implications on what happens here. The reason I say it was a perfect storm is because everyone's trading on the way up. And then the uninformed crypto environment coined a phrase hodl. And basically, that's what all the cool kids say. It basically means hold your assets. So every, when there was a dip, so everyone's trading, trading, trading. Then there was a dip and no one did anything. We're waiting for the day that Ethereum goes to a million dollars and all these different things, but you're holding it right now. And then you've gone through a financial year end. When does CGT get applied on the sale? Everyone's buying, selling, buying, selling, buying, selling all the way to the top. Now everyone holds these assets at the bottom without having realized the loss. How on earth is an accountant meant to go in here, an advisor meant to go in here and make, have any clue about what's happening? It is an absolute minefield. That's the problem we have. Guess how many crypto transactions there are a day? One million per day. That's just an average over the last 12 months. Some days it will get up to 10 million. A day. Average in Australia, uh, the average person in Australia has four accounts, four trading platforms. Each of them, according to the ATO, needs to be governed. They need to be reported. So you give your account a spreadsheet from each. Hundreds of thousands of transactions no lock is taken on board. It, I don't know. I'm, I'm looking forward to looking at the case study of this FY22, the first year of, uh, of reporting uh, crypto trades, because it is chaos. And even the most sophisticated accounting firms still, there's, there's very few who are pushing into this space uh, strongly and, and confidently. Because it's just... Yeah. Holding the dip, that's what they call it, holding the dip. Basically, they're holding this, this I mean, loss that they have to report. Anyway, the solution, we have to guide. Accountants, advisors throughout the years have earned their money, their, their right by advising their clientele of the right things to do or giving them different options. Right now, the majority of accountants are struggling because they don't know the best options. The first thing we have to do is gain information. Before giving any, before giving any advice, we have to gain information. So you have to find a way of mapping all these different spreadsheets into one form so it can be used. We are partnered with accountants all over the country, wherever we can value in. And we've got a number throughout my talks around the country. We've got a number of uh, crypto calculators for, for accountants, advisors that can bring all this into one. Um, please, please feel free to reach out if you do want anything in that regard, just a simple thing. It's, it's a non, uh, it's a non financial generation piece at the moment. It's just a simple, uh, it's just a simple handball over with, with, with details, anything we can do in this accounting space to move this blockchain into the more regulated and real world we can and will. Um, lending, if you use lending, if you lend on a piece of cryptocurrency, that's use one Bitcoin, Let's use a 100,000 Australian dollars worth of Bitcoin. If you lend on that, you still own it. There's no CGT implications. And all of a sudden you can hold it for past that one year mark. And then you can sell it if you want down the track, but you can still use it right now in the real world. Let's say you've got hundred K of, of, um, of Bitcoin, happily from all over the place, give you 50% LVR, taking that Bitcoin, taking that $100,000 into add security. 
me 50k to put into your business working capital that's what i really liked about it business owners who hold something they don't know what to do with it they don't want to get rid of it they don't want to use it to pay for things they want to hold it okay well let's put some liquidity into it by giving them debt on it they can then use the debt in the real world that for me really got me hooked just that just that idea where does this lead on to and where is it leading on to right now the reason i spoke about nfts just quickly earlier um is nfts are the lifeblood of of technology moving forward of information sharing moving forward um right now we're able to transact properties on the underlying company of a property wrap it up as an nft much like that letter versus a text it's wrapped up into a little phone ready to send you're able to wrap up real world assets into this digital little magnificence once you have it in, in this little digital parcel it can be divided into a hundred a thousand so this building let's say i own the building and i've got another opportunity over here and i need to give liquidity of oh, i need a couple of million i can sell seven shares 700 shares in the building it's like your own it's, it's like your own public listing all done very purposefully very simply through blockchain technology that blew my mind when i when i could see it because what assets can be can be used properties companies any underlying piece everyone thinks it's a, a gorilla smoking a cigar these nfts and the technology behind it will change our generation without any equivocation the biggest takeaway today is is the planning piece we must we i implore every accountant and advisor watching to not ignore this space like it's a flash in the pan it is here it is it is upon us we are already on this or on this wave i can't surf but i'm on this damn wave i'm gonna hold on to it we must stay ahead of the curve we must advertise ourselves as understanding this space because you know what if, if one person that goes who's watching here today goes out and advertises that they understand this space and just listens is a whole new environment coming forward that they lock in their future business because we're all right for disruption every one of us by locking in by being innovative by showing your clients that you care about them, by you care about the technology you're willing to change that's the story to, to take away is understanding i would love to speak about any, any further with anybody it's a, it's a long a very long topic and if i go too deep i tend to lose a lot of people but i'm, I'm more than happy open door to to have any questions have any conversations i'm hoping that you don't have too difficult questions coming forward <laughs> i'll see what i can do but thank you very much for your time and energy today it's been thank you. Thank you. one of the questions that was asked about is, is about the software um yep. that, i mean there's lots of options of software at the moment um are you seeing one that you you know that people are using in preference or is it a case by case it, it is a bit case by case and right. i don't want to seem like i'm holding the cards close to the chest cryptocurrency tax calculator.com or whatever whatever yeah. it is it is one there's half a dozen though depending on who you're using it for depending on whether you're an advisor whether you're an accountant of of small medium businesses or an accountant of individuals yeah. each of their sort of sweet spot so it's not a blanket approach um but there are, there are probably half a dozen genuine players in the space we can simply drop a, a spreadsheet in and another spreadsheet and it sort of combines everything yeah. it spits out the number at the bottom and that's the number so in may imagine this year in may accountants had that information they'd be able to plan and tell that their, their, their clients to sell some of these often don't just hold because it's cool and it's in the discord sell some of these assets realize some losses and you won't pay the tax on it you couldn't because they didn't the majority didn't understand this space right and what do you, and in the finance space what, what are you seeing in respect what's a normal you know an inquiry you know and, and who's in that space from the finance world yeah perfect so this we've got 13 lenders globally yeah i doubt you would have heard of uh too many of them they're, they're fintechs all over the world or funds um we <laughs> we're being given up to 80 percent lbr on, on on bitcoin and the top sort of five assets we made a decision <laughs> Fortunately, about 18 months ago to purely cap it, unless you're a sophisticated investor who knows a lot more than us, yeah. and we're just a pathway, we'll cap it at sort of 50% LVR. That LVR, that, well, that fiat currency, fiat Australian dollars, can be used to pay down a 
property purchase. So they can get that low doc option. So mortgage brokers all over the country who can't quite get their clients over the line. They don't have the cash, but I've got a load of Bitcoin. Okay, well, that's great, good for you. And they used to walk away. Now they've got an answer. Okay, we'll use some of that Bitcoin as leverage. We'll give you $50,000, $100,000, whatever it might be to complete their deal, to complete their mortgage lend and to put their clients in the property that they want. Yeah. So that's that's been wonderful. We're seeing a lot of uh, working capital for businesses because if your business has had a dip, but you've got X amount of currency over there that you don't know what to do with and you don't want to sell it because you're educated enough not to pay too much CGT, lend on it. Push the money back into your business. Yep. And that, is that where the inquiry rates sort of coming at, at the moment from accountants and you know who have not either lots of knowledge on this area or some knowledge they're coming and asking correct those opportunities every one of the everyone every accountant would have a client in their book who will ask them about crypto yeah and i know the industry fairly well i'd like to think the majority of the time it's no sorry i don't really know too much or very high level which is understandable they're the people who are bringing us introductions because we're showing a bit of understanding in the space and giving other options that might not be just pay your tax yeah because that's that's where accountants advisors have, have gained their wealth worth over the years. That's why small business <laughs> use them because they need good advice yep. and to see all the options. This is just a new a new world. So we're here to help wherever wherever possible. Fantastic, excellent. Well, it's clearly Luke, you are you're the expert, um, and um, <laughs> and so we will provide you know your details. Um, it was on the um, you know the uh, yeah, advice, and, and we'll also pass to everyone else. Who's Lovely, there. thank you. Thanks Thanks for Penny. <laughs> Um, we're conscious of time, um, as we always are, um, and, and people's uh, lunch breaks are either about to end or about to start. Um, Cassandra, um, who's from our office, um, is going to present um, a very briefly and quickly, because we have had uh, presentations on the past on small business restructures, um, but she's going to give a, a quick update of uh, the market and what we're seeing um, in that small business restructuring space. Um, so thank you, Cassie, for Thank you, Thank you. So, everyone, thank you for, for coming in person. It's quite exciting having people back in the office. And for those at home, I appreciate it. Um, my name is Cassandra and I'm a senior manager and I head up the small business restructuring team here at Rogers Reedy. So maybe if I get my slides working, well, Andrew can do that. Um, when we think of a global pandemic, lockdowns and supply chain disruptions and how it may affect small businesses, we would assume that that number, um, that the number of liquidations and other insolvency events would be extremely high. Surprisingly or unsurprisingly for some, um, this wasn't the case during COVID pandemic, the COVID pandemic. But this relaxed position is changing and it's changing fast. The ATO um, are back actively collecting debt and business owners can no longer ignore their debt anymore. After sending out thousands of warning letters from April onwards, the ATO is now issuing 150 director penalty notices a day and has referred 1,500 with debt above $100,000 to credit reporting bureaus. Based on the latest ASIC figures, we can see that the insolvency rates are back to pre-pandemic levels. So just to kind of give you a bit of context, in the first four weeks of this financial year, we saw 674 appointments, uh, insolvency appointments, sorry, um, compared with 697 in July 2019. By comparison, appointment levels for the same period in July 2020 was only 341 and 385 in July 2021. So just those numbers alone, you can see that we're back to those pre-pandemic insolvency rates. So there's absolutely no doubt that this is being driven by the ATO and um, by them finally taking the appropriate recovery action against the mountain of debt and non-reporting they've built up over the last couple of years. It is clear um, that the ATO is primarily they're signaling to companies and company directors that they have to do the right thing. The ATO isn't going to the point of shutting down businesses yet, as Brent had mentioned earlier today. There's been less than 10 ATO initiated wind ups so far this financial year. But it's clear that directors of businesses in financial distress need to take the necessary um, steps to initiate an insolvency process themselves. 
The ATO is also, they're insisting on more formal arrangements across the board. For instance, we are seeing that the businesses making voluntary repayments to the ATO, are, they're, they're being targeted by the, they're still being targeted by the ATO and the directors themselves are being hit with director penalty notices. Um, so there are there are options and one that we've spoken about previously and we at Rogers really definitely believe in is the small business restructure process. So this process, um, it allows directors of small companies to stay control of their business while they work with the restructuring practitioner um, to save it, to restructure their balance sheet, to write off, um, you know, their debt. It gives the company some breathing space to develop a plan um, that will provide for the continuation of its business and the best return for creditors given its financial circumstances. The process itself is the, pretty simple, um, particularly if you have a good restructuring practitioner um, guiding you. And it's also relatively quick compared to other types of insolvency appointments. So here at Rogers Reed, people um, present, we have a little handy checklist of the eligibility requirements. People at home, please contact us, um, our details obviously at the end of the slide. And um, just for this, for the brochure, which shows the eligibility um, requirements and the checklist. So in summary, um, the process itself, and we've got up here the eligibility checklist, you can see it, it's, it's quite simple. Is the company insolvent or likely to become insolvent? Are tax lodgements up to date? Um, are employee entitlements up to date? So your wages, your super. Are liabilities less than $1 million, excluding employee entitlements? So this figure, it's quite low. It's very easy for even a small business um, to reach that $1 million quite quickly and then not be um, eligible for the small business restructure process. So this is hopefully an area, something that will change in the future, it will increase. And finally, another requirement is that the company um, or the director or any related party hasn't been involved in a simplified liquidation process or small business restructure in the previous seven years. Given the numbers, there's been, this has been around for just shy of two years, there, we've just hit 80 small business restructuring appointments Australia wide. Um, and I th think we've done 16. Yep, yeah, we've done 16 of those um, Australia wide. So we're definitely, we'd like to consider ourselves the experts having done quite a number, quite a fair share of them. So um, the objective of the SBR process is to keep businesses trading and to avoid liquidation. So let's have a look at a couple of case studies um, which show how the SBR process has been used effectively. So the first one we're going to look at is in the hospitality industry. Um, it was, is a cafe in regional Victoria. And as we, we will know, the, us Victorians, um, we had the most lockdowns and um, this company really suffered. So the um, trade restrictions imposed by the Victorian government um, reduced revenue, but fixed costs were maintained, um, lease expenses, et cetera. The company itself fundamentally had a profitable business and traded profitably after restrictions um, had ended. There's certain considerations we had, and I am conscious of time, so I'm not gonna go too, um, delve too much into it, but um, there's in, we had to consider what a return or a likely return would be in a hypothetical liquidation scenario. Even though there was a direct loan um, you know, considerable $320,000, the director didn't have the capacity to pay it. And that's the investigations that we did during the restructure process. We saw that. And we also saw there was $114,000 paid to the tax office, um, unfair preference. So that's another consideration of the tax office. So this, um, the plan itself that was put forward for about $48,000, it was a return of about 80 and a half cents in the dollar of the admitted claims of 260000 they ATO, they're definitely behind this. They they accepted this and they wrote off, um, you know, almost 82 cents in the dollar of their claim against the company. This company is thriving. It's got 22 employees that are continuing their employment with the business. Um, and so it's definitely something that uh, accountants should be looking at for their clients, given that their um, the ATO is definitely backing this. Um, I'll move, I'll do one more quick case study. So this particular one, um, it doesn't meet the general objective of an SBR that to assist a company to keep trading in the future. This one, it was another restaurant, it's definitely huge in the hospitality space with the lockdowns. Um, 
definitely affected uh, profitability and their ability to trade. But this one was a restaurant. They tried to sell, the directors tried to sell the business a few months um, prior to closing up. It's just, there, there's, there's such consumer um, doubt out there and they weren't able to achieve a sale. Um, so they shut up, shut up shop, completely done. And we came on board three months after it had closed down. Um, and this particular one, there was also the direct, one of the directors um, was a, he had property, he had capacity to pay. There was an insolvent trading claim. It was quite evident that the company had traded whilst insolvent. So in a liquidation scenario, that insolvent trading claim, the liquidator shouldn't have too much issue, issues actually collecting those funds. Having said that, the, all the costs that are involved in a liquidation, um, the plan that was put up by the directors was for about $33,000, and that was a return of 20, 20 odd cents in the dollar on $165,000 admitted claim. The ATO, again, they supported it. Um, even though the company didn't fit into the ordinary mould, if they supported it, the um, ATO wrote off about 80 cents in the dollar of their claim, and a director was spared from insolvent trading claim. So I'll just, um, I had another case study. I won't talk about that. So we'll just go to a snapshot after this. The numbers, you can see them yourself. So in the first example that we spoke about, admitted debt, $260,000. The return under the plan, 48, that's 81.46% um, that the creditors have written off. And the numbers are fairly, fairly consistent. So it's definitely great for a company that does want to continue trading. And even if it doesn't, to limit some personal liability of the directors where it's applicable and where it's relevant. So thanks, everybody. Uh, look, we're, we're definitely big believers um, in the small business restructuring uh, regime, which started last year. It is new. Um, a lot of our um, competitors in the space um, just don't support it. Um, we just think it's a great alternative um, um, to liquidation um, and, and it, it works. And, and then Cassie is an expert in that space. And um, so if you do have any clients that fit uh, that criteria and, and if you're unsure, please reach out. Also reach out and get a, a chocolate as well, Cassie. We've got yes. some uh, SBR chocolates. So um, even, before we eat them all, right? Yeah, yeah, please, please. We've got boxes of them. So if, if you please contact us and we'll send you a, um, a bundle for your um, for your staff. Thank you once again. Uh, it's it's after one o'clock. Um, really appreciate uh, everyone attending today. Thank you to, uh, to Edward um, and Luke. Thank you very much for um, you know uh, presenting great uh, three great um, presentations. As I said, from this is just really a snapshot into these presentations. I, I really do insist that everyone, you know, if you do have a client in the space, is to, to reach out um, to our presenters today. Um, we will um, provide their contact details, which we have previously. Um, so if you do have any questions, do reach out to them. Thank you. Uh, we'll be back in September. We're going to have a grand final uh, webinar. Um, watch this space. We've got uh, someone very interesting. We had uh, we had someone quite. Um, we, we had someone very interesting last year and we're going to have someone um, equally as um, important in the AFL space that's going to present to us. So um, uh, watch the space, there'll be invites coming out in the next few weeks. But thank you very much and um, we'll uh, see you very soon. Thank you.